Welcome to New Life Online. Finally, the Shetland weather has caught up with me. The weather today is rotten, so for those of you who like to guess the location, uh, this is my living room. I'm sorry to spoil your fun uh, this week. But it's great to be together. If you're in our hubs or you're at home, we're delighted to have you join us. If you are in our hubs, your host is just going to take a moment to tell you and give you a little bit more information about what's going to take place this morning. For those of you who are watching at home, just chat amongst yourselves for a minute. I'm going to read this from Romans chapter 12 and it says this and so dear brothers and sisters I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you let them be a living and holy sacrifice the kind he will find acceptable this is truly the way to worship him don't copy the behavior and customs of this world but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think then you will learn to know God's will for you which is good and pleasing and perfect father as we gather across these islands and across our computer screens this morning i pray dear god that our worship our lives will be a pleasing sacrifice to you god in response to all that you've done for us lord how you've loved me i don't deserve but father we want to return our praise our worship our honor and our thanks to you today for all you've done thank you for who you are in jesus name amen let's worship together today Lord, how you love me, I don't deserve grace on top of grace. More than I've asked for, more than I'm worth, grace on top of grace. How sweet the sound, once lost, now found, 
heaven came down and grace rescued me. You took my place with your grace on top of grace. Lord, how you love me, I don't deserve grace on top of grace. More than I've asked for, more than I'm worth, grace on top of grace. God, we thank you for your goodness to us. We thank you that, Lord, even though we don't deserve it, Lord, you've poured out your grace and your mercy upon our lives. How sweet the sound that once I was lost, but now I'm found. God, I thank you for that grace that's on my life, that's on each and every one of our lives. We have so much to thank you for. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's hear about some of the things that we've got to thank God for this morning. As we take a minute in our hubs, just to share some praise reports and some things that we can pray for in our hubs and in our homes.
the women have just finished doing their recent run of their Bible study. And we're going to hear today some reports of what God's done in their lives as they've studied together. Over the last couple of months, we have been meeting as women every second Friday lunchtime to do the great study, Get Out of Your Head by Jenny Allen. We've been studying through Philippians and it has been so brilliant having so many different women share about what they've been learning through Philippians, watching the videos together and just being able to meet and see how each other are. And this week we have got Heather and Davina just sharing a little bit about what they've learned over the last three months during this study. Hi, I'm Heather and I've been asked by Tiffany just to share uh, what I've gained from joining the Women's Bible Group on a Friday. We've recently been studying the book of Philippians and um, <clears throat> one of my aims was that I have been quite disconnected from the Word. I haven't been studying my Bible. So this has encouraged me um, to start reading through. Um, we've had a guide what to do and reading through the book of Philippians. I've learned lots about Paul and how he was in captivity and yet his mind was always free. Paul was such a man that all he wanted to do was spread the gospel to use his time wisely to do this. And even though he was in prison, everyone knew him by his reputation that was a godly man. And he lived to spread the word and encourage others to come to know God. And that made me look at my reputation. All the things that are coming into my head, all the negative thoughts, knowing that you know they're not true and yet you start believing them. And then I needed to really start looking at the word. And that's what I did. And it really helped me. And then this uh, study guide helped us to really focus on our faith, being silent in God, giving everything to God, but trusting in him because we can do anything in God's strength and not to believe the lies. But also that we should be shining lights, spreading the gospel, letting people see us and think, We'd like to be like that person. What have they got that we haven't? And then we'd be, it'd be easy to share who we are, that we have God in our lives and we have hope. And we don't need anything else. It's so easy in these times to focus on the flesh instead of the spirit. The spirit. And I've really found it a challenge. But it's really made me look at myself and see how I can spread God's word, be a better person, be a better child of God. And I've really enjoyed it, made new friends, and it's been a really enjoyable learning experience. I'm really thankful that I've been able to participate in this woman's Bible study. It has really helped me to get control of my thoughts, um, to learn that I can have good repetitive thoughts, um, not just focusing on bad thoughts. Um, it's helped me to figure out spirals in my life, um, things in my life that I've maybe like continuously been thinking about it in my day to day and changing those thoughts and replacing them with the word of God. And that's been a light to me. And I've loved just being able to go through Philippians. It's just given me a good, just a whole new perspective on Philippians and to be able to learn and to understand it from a completely different perspective. I guess I've always read it as a book, but in the Bible, but now I just kind of saw it from the perspective of this is a man, you know, who was in a prison and who was going through a hard time and was probably facing hard thoughts. And seeing how he dealt with his thought patterns just kind of showed me how can I deal with my thought patterns. Um, I really loved the whole kind of thing of being able to actually discuss things as well. Um, it was good to have Tiff there. She was like supportive and helping us to guide us through it. And even the study guide was really, really helpful. And to anyone in the future who would want to do a women's Bible study, I would encourage them. It's It was such um, a good time to get in with the community and to listen to all these other women speak about different struggles, but also um, be able to encourage each other and to teach each other about new things. So. Thank you very much. Thank you so much to Bina and Heather for sharing all about what you've learned over the last few months. Um, so just to let everyone know, we're going to be changing things up slightly for the women's catch-ups. We're going to be changing them to monthly. 
Um, we've changed it from a lunchtime as well, we're going to change it to an evening so that more people who are working can join us. So it's going to be monthly from now on, half seven till half eight on a Wednesday night. Um, we're going to be changing up the format a little bit as well. Um, we really want it to be a space where we can just um, meet together and um, chat as well as study. Um, and we're also going to be changing the name. So we're going to have a brand new name, um, but I'll tell you more about that in the following weeks. Um, but I really hope you can join us. Thanks. Thanks ladies, that's great to hear. And there'll be more details coming up soon of what will be taking place uh, for the women in the coming weeks and months. We're going to go across the Sarah now at New Life Kids. Good morning Kids Club and all of our New Life Church families. This week we are all going to need a pen and paper. If you are at one of our hubs you should have some on your table. If you need to go and get some, go now. Got it? Are you back? Good. God gave us rules so that we would know how to treat others and how to respect the world that he created. We can find God's law in the Bible. Now, rules and law might sound a bit bossy, but God gave us his law because he loves us so much. God's law teaches us how to love God and love others. Now, we're going to do something together. Have you got your pen and your paper ready? Ready? Follow my instructions on your paper. Draw eight circles on the page of different sizes. Now, draw a box in one corner and a star in another corner. Draw three wiggly lines across the paper. Draw four straight lines on the paper. And now draw three diamond shapes. Now, are you ready to see my drawing? Does your picture look exactly the same as mine? Probably not. We all followed the same instructions, but everyone drew a different picture. Everyone thinks and sees things differently. Sometimes when you are making a choice, you might Go with your gut feeling, or you might follow what your heart tells you. But when our heart is leading us to do something that doesn't honour God, it's not such a good thing to do. And God's law can help us to make good choices. There is a story in the Bible about Moses. God wanted his people to know how to live. So he gave Moses the Ten Commandments to remind us what is right. Now, nobody, but nobody obeys all the rules all of the time. We all make mistakes and that's when we sin. If we compare ourselves to God's law, we see how sinful we are. But what if my sin was erased, taken away, every mistake, forgiven, forgotten. 
Would God do that? Well, he already did. God saw the mess we were in and he sent Jesus as a free gift to earth to fix things. When Jesus died on the cross and came back to life, he fixed our broken relationship with God. He made things right again and forgave our sins. Jesus took the punishment for all of our sin and God gave us grace for our mistakes. No matter who you are or what you have done, God's grace is free because Jesus already paid the price. Both the law and God's gift of Jesus go hand in hand. The law shows us that we all need Jesus and Jesus helps us follow the law. We need both grace and truth. Now you have one more week to send me pictures of your sunflowers. Send them to me, show me how tall they are. I can't wait to send out prizes in the next week or two. Here's what's coming up in the next few weeks at New Life News. Hello and welcome to New Life News. Here's what's coming up this week. We're starting a new course in October called the Wholeness Course. This shows you both the theology and the psychology of what it means to be human in a biblical way. If you're interested in joining this course, then please get in touch with a member of the leadership team. We have a half hour prayer on a Monday and Thursday at 7 p.m. This is half an hour prayer where you can pray with the church and pray for anything that's on your mind and is a great way to come and relax at the end of the day. Now, if you're at the age of P7 to S6, then we have a youth here at New Life Shed. We have Zoom calls on a Monday and Thursday at 7 p.m., Monday being the Unite Bible Study and Thursday being the Youth Hangout. It's a great way to engage with more people your age and a great way to have fun and just hang out. At New Life Shetland, we have life groups. These are placed in Chandra, Sandwick, Bray, A and Lerwick. Now if you're interested in any of these events that I have told you about today, please get in touch with us at newlife.shetland.gmail.com or on any of our social medias. That's all for now. Have a great week. Now and again, we love to hear what is going on in people in our church's lives. And we're going to hear from Ellie Smart this morning and hear what God's been doing in her life and hear where she will be this time tomorrow. Okay, great to have you join us, Ellie, at New Life Online. I'm sure a lot of the people who are watching uh, know you, have seen you ar around. But uh, for those who don't, uh, tell us a bit about yourself. Okay, well, hi, I'm Ellie Smart. Um I'm married to Ray, um, and I'm my I'm the only daughter in my family. I've got three brothers. Um, I have um, I've been married to Ray for nearly forty one years, um, and we have three children, a son and two daughters, and six grandchildren, three boys and three girls, and um, yeah, that's just basically who I am. Great. Yeah. So. Obviously, judging by your accent, uh, you're not originally from Shetland. So can you tell us a little bit about how you ended up to be coming to Shetland? Um, yeah, well, I'm, I am South African. And, um, and I believe the Lord brought us here. Um, uh, in 2007, we came here for, I think it was about three days um, for an interview to serve the church here. And um, Ray was quite keen on coming here, but I didn't feel the same way. I just thought this place was far too remote and there was no ways we, I, I could come from a big city into this small remote little island. Um, and because we couldn't agree, um, we went to, um, we, we accepted a call to a church in Ballantor and we were there for a while, um, but Ray still, had this sort of yearning to come to um, Shetland. In 2014, while well, he was on sabbatical in the Highlands, he was asked to come preach for a, a day or two here. And while he was here, they asked if, if he would like to become their minister. Um, he came back to South Africa and he received the call from there. And so they suggested that we come here for about two weeks so that we could live here 
fend for ourselves just to see if I, if, I, if I felt comfortable. So we did. In October 2014, we came back and we stayed for a while. Had to go and buy our own groceries, cook our own meals. So it was basically like living here. And um, I felt quite comfortable. I didn't feel it too remote. Um, so I said, so when we got back to South Africa, we prayed about it and um, we accepted the call to come. And we arrived here in January 2014 and 2015. Great. Um, so let me ask this where will you be this time tomorrow? Well, tomorrow, this time, I will be where I am right now in front of the computer, but at home instead of um, being at work with, um, at the airport um, because we still have to work from home. But normally, that's where I would be. I'd be at the airport um, working there. So what does that look like? Um, I work, I don't work at the terminal. Um, I work in um, my actual office that I work in is in the control tower, which is just past um, the barriers um, on your left-hand side. Um, the, what I, I'm, uh, aviation is a, a totally new concept or place for me to work in. I've never worked in there. So there's still, even though I've been there for five years, um, there's still lots to learn about it. Um, what I, what I am basically there is I'm an admin assistant, but also the senior management team's um, PA support. So I do a lot of their, um, their, 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 their sort of personal assistance, supporting them, running around off, doing things for them, but, all, but also doing the admin part where anything to do with the admin of the, of the, the airport is something that I do. Oh, very good. So do you miss right now the interaction with people while you're stuck at home? I do miss it. Um, I, there, there's, you know, we're, we're in the office I work at the moment, I just interact with the management team, um, my colleague, and the, the control tower, the people that do actually the air, air traffic control assistance and the controllers. So I don't have much to do with public unless they phone in. So, but it's, it's at home, I don't know, I, I just find it, there is that interaction with people other than your your family at work, so I, I do I do miss it. And um, but I think we're going to be at home for another good few months. So I've just got to grit my teeth and get on with it. So what would you say are your greatest challenges and your greatest joys? Um, okay, can I start with my joys? Yes, of course. My, my joys are um, first of all serving the Lord. Uh, I, I thoroughly enjoy doing that and um, doing anything that I feel he's asking me to do and um, reaching out to people. And my family are my biggest joys, my children, my grandchildren, and my husband. Um, my challenges, hmm, there's a few. Um, I think what it is for me, my challenges are um, to be a good witness for God, especially at work, because I'm the only Christian in the building. And um, also my lack of patience. Uh, I don't have much in, in, in store for that. Um, yeah, so I think those for me at the moment are, I think, my biggest challenges is yeah. being a good witness. So how has, how has COVID affected your life? What, what my greatest thing that I think COVID has affected is um, we won't be able to go and see our children and grandchildren as we normally do over Christmas as they're all in different countries. So this year, we're not going to be able to do that. So for me, that's the biggest thing that COVID has, ever, has affected. So how can we pray for you, Ellie? At the moment, I think um, we, we'll, what's the name, pray for um, God's wisdom and guidance about the decisions we have to make um, for our future. And um, I think also patience to wait for God's plans to come to fruition and have the faith to trust in him completely. Well, that's great, Ellie. Thank you for, for sharing that. We just want to pray for you just for a, a moment there just in, and pray God's blessing upon you. Thank you for taking the time to come on and share a little bit of uh, what's what's been happening and where you'll be this time tomorrow. Father God, I, I thank you for Ellie and thank you for 
uh, Lord, her sharing her story of or how you've brought her here. And, and Lord, I just pray your blessing upon her and, and Ray and her family. And Lord, as they've asked for prayer relating to the, the future, Lord, I just pray that you will lead and guide. I thank you, you're a God who has never stopped leading us. And uh, Lord, I just pray that, uh, Lord, you will continue to lead and guide. Father, we pray for uh, Ellie and Ray's family in different parts of the world. And Lord, as, as distance can be a real challenge and the feeling of, of being distant right now can be a real challenge. Lord, I, I just pray that you will bless them, that, uh, Lord, that they will feel you near, and that, Lord, that they, they will know that you are with them. Uh, Lord, I thank you for them and for the blessing that they are to your kingdom. And, uh, Lord, I just pray that you will help Ellie as she's uh, uh, working down in the, or working with those in the airport, that you will help her to, to be the witness that, you've, that she senses in her heart that she wants to be. Lord, we just ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to share communion across our hubs now. And somebody in your hub will lead you around the table this morning. And if you're watching online, then I'm going to do so and uh, going to lead you as we share communion. Remind us that we are part of something far greater than what we maybe see right now in our hubs or in our homes. And remind us that we are part of Christ's body, who, which was broken for you and I. This morning, we're going to share communion together. If you've not got the elements that you need to do that, then why don't you just take a moment and run and grab them. We're going to share the bread and the wine together. It says in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, For I pass on to you what I received from the Lord himself. On the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took some bread and gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it in pieces and said, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's take the bread together today. I thank you, Lord, for your body which was broken for us. And Lord, as we share communion across these islands today, Lord, I pray you'll make this a meaningful experience for us. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness to us. In Jesus' name, amen. It says that in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood. Do this in remembrance of me as often as you drink it. For every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are announcing the Lord's death until he comes. Father, I thank you for the opportunity to announce Lord, the Lord's death until you come. Thank you there's a day that you are coming back. And Lord, we thank you we can share communion and remember the sacrifice that you gave your life for us. Thank you, Lord, for doing that for me. Thank you for doing that for, one of, for all of us, Lord. And God, we just pray that this will be so meaningful this morning as we share communion together. In Jesus' name, amen. As we take the cup together, let's focus on the cross today. Fix our eyes upon the cross and remember the sacrifice that he made for you and for me. Let's worship.
final breath he gave Heaven looked away The Son of God was laid in the man Battle and the grave War on death was waged The power of hell for the broken The ground began to shake The stone was rolled away His perfect love could not be overcome Now death, where is your sting? Our resurrected King Has rendered you defeated Forever He is glorified Forever He is led The ground began to shake, the stone was rolled away, His perfect love could not be overcome. Now death, where is your sting? Our resurrected King has rendered you defeated for continue through our study of the book of Acts and we're going to read from Acts chapter 12 and it says this in verse 1 to 5 and then we're going to read from verse 20 to 25. About that time King Herod Agrippa began to persecute some believers in the church. He had the apostle James, John's brother, killed with a sword. When Herod saw how much this pleased the Jewish people, he also arrested Peter. This took place during the Passover celebration. 
Then he imprisoned him, placing him under the guard of four squads of four soldiers each. Herod intended to bring Peter out for public trial after the Passover. But while Peter was in prison, the church prayed very earnestly for him. Verse 20 verse, uh, to 25 says this, Now Herod was very angry with the people of Tyre and Sidon. So they sent a delegation to make peace with him because their cities were dependent upon Herod's country for food. The delegates won the support of Blastus, Herod's personal assistance, and an appointment with Herod was granted. When the day arrived, Herod put on his royal robes, sat on his throne, and made a speech to them. The people gave him a great ovation, shouting, It's the voice of a god, not of a man. Instantly an angel of the Lord struck Herod with a sickness, because he accepted the people's worship instead of giving the glory to God. So he was consumed with worms and died. Meanwhile, the word of God continued to spread, and there were many believers. When Barnabas and Saul had finished their mission to Jerusalem, they returned, taking John Mark with them. This morning, I want to talk on the subject of take out pride before it takes you out. You know, there are some stories in the Bible that never really get taught in Sunday school. Let's be honest. Although that being said, I did hear uh, recently a friend of mine share a story of how they were asked to deliver a Sunday school lesson based on that story in the Old Testament where one of the, the, the leaders went and was escaping the battle, went into a woman's house and she killed him by ramming a tent peg through his head. How are you meant to come up with a children's lesson uh, based on that story? I'm not entirely sure. It is, of course, though, the inspired word of God. And this story we've read here today is no different. It is the inspired word of God as we hear about King Herod who is eaten by worms and dies. What a tragic end to a king's life. You know, in this passage that we've read, and you, you can, you've maybe read through Acts chapter 12 this week, and you'll have seen that there are some amazing verses that uh, we could have studied today. We could have looked at how the church uh, prayed for Peter and God performed a miraculous prison break as he escaped from prison. And the reason we're not looking at that this morning is because you may remember that that actually kicked off our whole series of lockdown where we already looked at this passage earlier on this year. It was the final week of March, I think, to be precise. And uh, you can look at that and catch up on that on our YouTube channel uh, if you so wish. But as I said, so we've already looked at this passage. But here's the thing. This is the beauty of the Bible. There's always new stuff to learn. So whether you've looked at a passage once or a hundred times, God can still speak to us with something fresh through what we look at today. So we're going to look at a different aspect of this passage this morning, uh, because this passage isn't just about prayer and a miracle that took place, although that's an amazing aspect of the story. But uh, like we've seen, this passage is actually about persecution. It's about the church being persecuted and about the story of Herod, like we've read there. And in this chapter, we read about how Herod, really, he's one of the key perpetrators of persecution against the church. He was, he was king at that time, but he was really kind of a token king as he's under Roman law and Roman oppression. And uh, let's just say, though, that as a man, I would say Herod is not somebody that we should emulate, that we would like to say, oh, Herod, he's our hero. He's not somebody that we would like our lives to aspire to be like. None of us are going to do that with him. But this morning, I want to say that there's a little bit of Herod, I believe, that can be in each of our lives that we've got to take out before it takes out us. You see, the history of his family, and maybe you think this morning your family's messed up. Well, let's just take a look for a minute at Herod's family. Herod the Great, who was his grandfather, well, he's the one who was around Jesus' time who ordered the, the basically the genocide of all boys that were under two years old. Why? Because he was threatened by the birth of Jesus. We've got Herod Antipas, who was his uncle, who had John the Baptist beheaded and was around at the mock trial of Jesus. And we've got Herod Agrippa II, who's the son of the Herod we've read in today's passage, who later on in the book of Acts, we'll read about who is involved in the trial of Paul. As I said, you might think your family's messed up, but Herod's got some history of a family. You know, you might have a checkered family history, but I want to say this morning, you're not your father. You're not your mother. You don't need to follow in that family pattern. I once met with a young lad and he says, well, my grandfather was an alcoholic 
My dad's an alcoholic, so I guess I'm going to be an alcoholic. And I want to say that the power of the Holy Spirit can break into your family line. And you do not have to live under what has gone before. That actually you can change future generations through what the power of God and the power of the Holy Spirit does in your life today. What I'd suggest to us all today though, however, is that all of us can have traces of Herod in our lives. What do I mean by that? Well, it can be quite subtle. You see, we might not have the power or the influence or the profile that to cause the untold damage that the Herod family line did, but these character traits that he has, which I believe are evident in some of our lives, that to, if we were to allow them to grow, that they can breed and cause damage and insecurity and much more within our life. You see, the enemy comes to steal, kill and destroy. And if he can raise that Herod up in our lives, then he is winning at his task of making us less effective for the kingdom of God. And as I said, in our lives today, I pray that we, God will help us to deal with the Herod in it before it takes us out. So this morning I want to look at three characteristics of Herod that I believe that we have to deal with at some point in our lives if we want to grow and be effective for Jesus. And the first one is this, Herod was a people pleaser rather than a God pleaser. It said this, that he had the apostle James, John's brother, killed with a sword. But it says, when Herod saw how much this pleased the Jewish people, he also arrested Peter. This took place during the Passover celebration. Herod clearly loved the adulation of the people. You know, we do a lot of things for other people from our desire to be liked. Social media, they say that when you put a photo on social media and people like that post, that the feeling and the chemical effect that it does in our life can be similar to when a drug addict has a hit. So actually the, the, the attention and the like the likes that people can get on Facebook or on Instagram can actually be as addictive as a drug. And so we've got to realize the challenge of that within our society today. I watched a, a fascinating documentary recently called The Social Dilemma. And it talked about some of these things and the challenge of, of social media and the effect that that has on our psychology today. Now, this is not just, however, a new phenomenon to the world, although we can see that in the life of Herod. It says that he imprisoned Peter because it pleased the people what he'd done with James. So he's going to bring him out later on and probably have him executed like happened with James. He did it for the likes, just like people all around the world today are doing all kinds of daft stuff for the likes to win the attention of people. Herod did this for the likes. You can almost see him as he gets his selfie with Peter behind bars and he's like, hashtag in prison or whatever it might have been. It would have been his equivalent on these days. He saw how much killing James pleased the people. Now we want to have a good impression of us and a good impression is not a bad thing. But when pleasing people, when our image and our reputation, when this becomes more of a challenge and more important in our lives than pleasing the Lord, then that's when it becomes an issue. Now, I'm not going to be going out on a limb here to say that I believe that each and every one of us has at some point tried to please people, other, and it's came in, an, in a way of compromise to our walk with God with our faith in order that we make a good impression with people. We sing a song, or maybe you've sung a song in the, pla the past, Be Thou My Vision, and it's got this line in it, Riches I need not nor man's empty praise. But yet, how often is it that man's empty praise, we live our lives for that attention? Whether that be peer pressure, and you know, peer pressure can be a big thing in our lives, not just in young people's lives. I've heard people say, you show me your, your five best friends, and I'll show you where you'll be in five years' time. Because our friends and our, and, and our relationships have a huge effect on our lives, and that's why it's so important. Young people, old people, Get the right friends because their friends will very often determine your future. But actually, we ought to not live our lives for the praise and acceptance of those around us. We need to live our lives for an audience of one. You see, this is a battle that's highlighted in Scripture time and time again. Galatians 1 verse 10, For am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? Or am I trying to please man? If I were still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. Or John 12, 43, For they love the glory that comes from man more than the glory that comes from God. So this is a constant battle 
in the life of humanity. And there will always be a tension here. And so we need to take out this area of Herod in our lives where we can live to please people and live our lives for an audience of one, live to please the Lord. You see, actually one of the things that the Bible says in the book of Matthew, it says that your heavenly Father sees what is done in secret. You see, sometimes when we play for the crowd, when we live our lives to please the crowd, it can be public, but God sees what's done in secret. Let's live our lives in a way that please Him, that please that audience of one. You maybe have heard it said of a, of a superhero that has an alter ego, as in they've got a different uh, personality so that they can maybe live hidden in one way. But I want to say that we need to put our ego on the altar. We need to live our lives where we sacrifice our ego in order that we might live a life that pr- pleases Christ. Lord, help us lay the praise of people and our ego on the altar, that we may live lives that pr- please Christ and live lives for an audience of one. The second thing that we need to, to, to deal with the Herod in our lives is the area of pride. We need to take down our pride within each and every one of our lives. And we see this so clearly in Herod's life and the way that he lived and the, the way that he did certain things. And we read that in that second passage from verse 20 to 25. But we see the pride of Herod rise up. But each and every one of us has the potential to let pride rise up. You see, pride is at the root of all sin, right back in the Garden of Eden. It was like, you will, you will eat this and you will become like God. There'll be something of us or personally that's elevated. It's a pride thing. And, you know, we could list loads of Bible verses about how God, uh, you know, hates the proud and all that sort of stuff. But, uh, but I want to say that pride is something in each of our lives that we have to deal with. I've gone through times in my life when God has dealt with pride that I didn't even know was there. A couple of weeks ago, I talked about God's creative provision and how God had provided in a, my life in a time when my wages dropped by about 40%. And how it was a season of the miraculous as we saw the provision of God. But what I didn't talk about was how God dealt also in that season with the unknown pride that was in my life. That I didn't even know was there. You see, even though I was living in the provision of God, there were still parts of pride that had to be dealt with and worked out in my life. You know, I had a title that was stripped away. I had finances that were stripped away. And that probably exposed some areas of pride in my life, as I said, that I didn't even know were there. At the time we used to run a young adults group and they would come round to our house. And I remember one night we're sitting at our life group with these young adults. They talked about the wages that they were on and all of them were on more than me. And it was painful. I remember feeling sick because even though I was living in the provision of God and he was my provider and not my wages, there was something of a pride in my identity that God had to work out within me. The thoughts of I deserve more. The thoughts of I could have pursued my degree and uh, you know I would have been earning the big bucks and uh, pursuing what I'd studied at university rather than serve the call of God. But God was working that out of me. Do you know what? That's so much better out than in. But at the time it was painful. It hurt as this was worked out of my life. You see, I'd lost perspective and pride does that. I had missed all that was around me and pride does that. But this was a season of pruning. God was refining me. And I believe making me more like him as he dealt with a Herod that was beginning to rise up in my life. We've got to deal with that before it takes us out. You see, pride can manifest itself in lots of different ways in our life. Some obvious, some more covert. You know, you might be relying on yourself rather than God. That's pride. You might be talking down of yourself. Well, that's just pride in disguise. I want to say that that is something that is a real challenge in our in, in our society where people talk down on themselves it can be a sense of false humil- humility false humility is simply pride in disguise we need a real dose of humility in our lives humility is not thinking less of yourself humility is thinking of yourself less lord deal with the herod of pride in each of our lives god work in those areas that i may appeal humble before you And the third area of Herod that we have to deal with in our life is that Herod wanted the glory for himself. You know, the Bible says that God will share his glory with no other. It said of Herod, it says he accepted the people's worship instead of giving the glory to God. We already talked about putting our ego on the altar. You know, Jesus says that we ought to die to ourselves. We need to sacrifice I and live our lives for the glory of God. 
You know, I wonder whose glory are you living for? Is it for personal glory? Or are you living for God's glory? What even does that word glory mean? See, I heard somebody or read of somebody saying this, that the word glory is more like the word beauty than it is of the word basketball. What a random illustration to use. But what they meant there is you can describe what a basketball is. You could describe what it looks like, how it feels, the size and the shape. So that if somebody was to hold a basketball, they could distinguish that and they would know that it's a basketball they were holding from your description rather than say a rugby ball. But they were like, beauty? How do you define what beauty is? Well, I could take you to somewhere, a scene outside and point to something and say, well, that's beautiful, that's beauty. And gradually as we start pointing to things that are beautiful, then maybe we could gain a picture and a collective understanding of what beauty is. But actually to put the word beauty in the same way as to put the word glory into words is actually quite a difficult thing to do. You know, I've heard it said of, of the glory of God that God is in a class by himself. He has infinite perfections, infinite greatness, and infinite worth. That the glory of God is the manifest beauty of his holiness. It is the going public of his holiness. So to live for the glory of God is to show off the holiness of God, to show off the greatness of God, to show off the perfection of God through each and every one of our lives. The Bible says that creation shouts the glory of God. That actually if we look and we look at creation and we see how the perfection of God as we see creation all, of our, all around us. You know, we see the beauty and the holiness and the greatness of God in a changed life. And that's how we ought to live our lives. Not so that when somebody looks at us, they see how awesome John is or how awesome you are, but that they see how awesome God is. That they see the greatness of God being displayed in each and every one of our lives. You see, the problem with Herod was that he wanted the people to see his greatness. He wanted people to know how good that he was. In fact, he even went to the point where he wanted people to worship him. Again, it goes right back to the garden. You will become like God. Where actually in each of us, we've got to sacrifice I. We've got to deal with I in our life. That our lives, when people look at them, they'll say, what's different about you? Well, they see Jesus in us. They see the greatness of God through the way that we live our lives. May our lives always point to the glory of God. May our lives always point to the greatness of God. May I always preach for the glory of God. May our lives display the glory of God. May we live not to make us famous, but to make him famous. Ultimately, we have a choice of which king we serve. Do we serve the Herod in us? Or do we serve the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords? You see, we can serve a far superior king than Herod. We can serve a far superior king than us. We can serve Jesus, the King of Kings. And the Bible says this, that one day every knee will bow before him and every tongue will confess that he is Lord. I wonder, I would rather bow the knee before him in this life than have to do it. And today, if you don't know him, then I'm going to pray a prayer and you can get to know him. You can make him the king of your life and deal with I, deal with what is in your life. If you don't know Jesus, then I pray that today you will bow the knee to the king. Let's pray. Repeat this after me. Dear Lord Jesus, I ask you to come into my life. Be the Lord of my life. Make me more like you. I make you Lord and King. Forgive me of all my sins. Today I choose to follow you. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer and you meant it, then please do click in the chat. It says, I raised my hand. And one of our team will pray with you. We'll send you a book to help you on your journey called The New Testament Experience. It won't cost you anything. It's not about joining a church. It's about coming to know Jesus and beginning a relationship with him. And we'd love that to happen. We want nothing more than to see people come to know the amazing Jesus that we love in our lives today. Let's join in worship as we finish our final song. Let's raise a hallelujah to the one who is king, the one who deserves all of our praise today. Let's lift our eyes to him and let's lift our hands and worship the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords.
John the Baptist said this, He must increase and I must decrease. What an amazing statement that is that we can make for our lives. And maybe that's a prayer that you want to pray today. If you are struggling like Herod did and dealing with that first Herod in our life where we're a people pleaser rather than a God pleaser, I wonder if we can pray that prayer. prayer. God, you increase and let me decrease.
Thank you for joining us at New Life Online. It's been great to be together, whether you've been watching us at home or whether you've been joining us in one of our hubs. We're going to meet together in our hubs again in two weeks' time as we continue meeting fortnightly across the islands. We trust that you have an awesome week. As always, if we can be of any help at all, then please do get in contact with myself or contact us through our church email at newlife.shetland at gmail.com or through one of our social media accounts. But we pray you'll have an awesome week. We'll see you online next week. God bless.